everyone. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me a very special guest, Dr. Joe Pizzorno, who is a world-leading authority on science-based natural medicine, which is a term that he coined in 1978 as founding president of Bastyr University, which is a, a naturopathic university. Uh, he's a naturopathic physician, educator, researcher, and expert spokesman. He is editor-in-chief of PubMed Indexed IMCJ. And, and what is that, Dr. Pizzorno? That's the... Uh, Integrative Medicine, a clinician's journal. Okay, there you go. And then the treasurer of board of IFM, which is Institute of Functional Medicine, I believe. Yes. And board member of American Herbal Pharmacopoeia and a member of the science boards of the HECT Foundation, Gateway for Cancer Research and Bioclinic Naturals. He is author or co-author of five textbooks uh, and, and seven consumer books, including the Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine and the Toxin Solution, both of which I'm big fans of. Here I have in my hands, if you're watching the video, this gigantic book. The Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine, which was a massive undertaking. This thing is over a thousand pages. Uh, and as an intellectual, political, and academic leader in medicine for over four decades, he has been widely honored. In 2018, he received a leadership award from the Integrative Health Symposium and Visionary Award by the Academy of Integrative and Health Medicine. So that is... Uh, this is an extremely impressive bio. Um, each one of these books of the seven books uh, of the consumer books, not even the textbooks, is an impressive book. Uh, and I have to say that I'm, I'm personally very honored to have you on the show because I've really enjoyed your work for a very long time and I'm a big fan of what you're doing. So welcome to the show, Dr. Joe Pizzorno. Such a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, also, thank you for the work you're doing. It's... Um, one of my life missions has been that there's a, a lot of unnecessary suffering in the world because this body of knowledge we call natural medicine, it, people have not been aware of it. And when they become aware of it, they've kind of discounted it as being not scientific. So I spent, you know, almost five decades developing the scientific basis for natural medicine. Yeah, actually, I think that's a really nice introduction to this. I, I'm very curious, you know, you, cur you coined this term. Uh, science-based natural medicine in 1978, when I I'm sure at that time, you know, that term was probably seemed like a, a, a totally, you know, like an oxymoron, like a, like a paradoxical term to many in conventional medicine, yes. who, thought, who thought that everything that's natural couldn't possibly work. And, you know, we've seen this, now there's a body of tens of thousands of studies on all, all kinds of things, like from herbs to mm. light therapies to, um, you know, all kinds of other natural therapies. And so there's this huge body of evidence, but we're still sort of struggling against this conventional medical model of, of allopathy that's very drug-centered, that wants people to operate under the perception that only drugs are scientific and everything outside of what conventional medical doctors are doing, all that natural medicine stuff, that's all alternative quackery. Right. So I, I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to that and kind of how you coined this term and, and the evolution of that whole space. So, um, so well said, by the way, it's kind of interesting, the looking at how conventional medicine has tried to discount this body of knowledge. And while I think we're aware of the challenges right now, we have to realize this has been going on for a very long period of time, uh, conventional medicine trying to challenge this. Uh, if you go back to the founding of the American Medical Association, according to the history books I've read, their first functions were to number one is to kick out all the women. The second was to kick out all people of color. And the third thing they did was to say, if you are a medical doctor and you even collaborate in any way with anybody who's not an MD, we will remove your license and remove your degree. Okay. So they've always been ag against this. So you can't look at uh, these, going back to Grecian times, because that's where we've got good histories. There's been kind of two schools of medicine. <clears throat> there's one school of medicine, which we're aware of right now is the dominant school which is what might be called the interventionist approach. And the interventionist approach says, well, the body, is, um, the body makes mistakes and the role of the doctor is to fix the body and take over control. But there's been another school of medicine, which is probably people think about Hippocrates as being a good example of that, which says, well, the role of the doctor is to realize that the body has tremendous ability to heal and our job is to promote health, make the body stronger. 
And as you make the body stronger, then you don't have as much or as, uh, disease and even reverse disease. So it's one side promote health, the other side is intervene and take control. Now I want to be very clear, we need both perspectives. For example, I'm an avid motorcycle rider. <clears throat> and heaven forbid I get in an accident, take, in, take me to the emergency room. You know, they're really good at setting the bones and uh, you know, stitching lacerations and such. But they know nothing about how to promote healing side of all of this. Mm -hmm. So if you have an accident, go in the emergency room. But if you want to be healthy, going to conventional medical doctor is probably one of the worst things you can do because conventional medicine doesn't actually promote health. It just treats disease. I love that. I love how you don't mince words. <laughs> right. So yeah, I've been doing this a long time. You talk about energy. You know, here I am, this guy, I won't say my age, but you know, I've been at this for a long time. Yeah. I have lots of energy because I practice natural healing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I love that. So yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're a godfather in this space. So much, much, much respect to, uh, to be talking to you. I mean, for everything that you've done, it's, it's, uh, it's a privilege. I've admired you for, for a long time. Okay. So I, wa I want to talk, I want to spend the majority of this time talking about your most, most recent book, The Toxin Solution, right. and the concept of toxins. Yes. So one of, one of the claims that you make in this book, sort of the central claim, is that most chronic disease that we're seeing in the world today is the result of, of toxins. And so they're, sort of their, they're the primary contributor, or at least a major contributor to most chronic disease. Yes. It, this is an interesting claim because I, I think this, this space of toxins, and, you know, the discussion of toxins and detoxing has been contaminated with a lot of uh, charlatans and mm -hmm. people promoting pseudoscience and right people just speaking nonsense and sort of these vague allusions to toxins, but you can tell these people don't really know what they're talking about. And then we also have, uh, you know, that's uh, a lot of people in the, the skeptical, the skeptic movement or the evidence-based movements, like evidence-based fitness movements and nutrition movements, for example, where I've seen, I'm kind of in some of those Facebook groups. So I see kind of things that go around. And one, one of the things that goes around is like, oh, you, you have a liver and you know, your liver's job is to cleanse the toxins. And therefore, you know, this idea that we, our bodies accumulate toxins is just nonsense. You know, um, you know, that's what your liver's for. So, you know, all this talk of nonsense is just pseudoscience. And so there's, there's, on the one hand, you have like people promoting a toxin narrative that are saying nonsense. And on the other hand, you have people in evidence-based circles who are just speaking purely out of ignorance and don't realize that there's thousands of studies on this topic. So, what what do you, what do you perceive as sort of the the main evidence backing up this claim that toxins are uh, a major contributor to most chronic disease today? So, again, lots of ter uh, territory to cover. So, when we think about toxin, first off, let's think about toxins from a kind of a broad perspective. It's pretty much any molecule or element in the body that disrupts our physiolo physiology. So. Those toxins can come from within the body, they can come from outside the body. So for example, we have metabolic waste in the body, things like uric acid and homocysteine, things like this. Uh, these are toxins, and our body has mechanisms to get rid of them. And you look at the gut, and our gut is full of 10 times as many bacteria as we have cells in our bodies. And those bacteria are metabolically active. They produce some molecules that are good for us, like B vitamins. They also produce a number of molecules that are pretty bad for us. And when they get absorbed into the body, the liver's got detoxified. And then we look at the environment and we see metals and elements, in, metals and um, chemicals in the environment that are both good for us, like, um, you know, for example, chromium is a metal. You have to have small amounts of it in order for the body to function properly. We also have things like arsenic. And arsenic has actually been a toxin we've been exposed to as we've evolved as a species for millions of years. So it turns out that we have great mechanisms for breaking down things like arsenic. So as long as we're not constantly exposed to the arsenic, we're okay. But we're now entering an era of industrialization where we've produced what are called new to nature molecules. And these are molecules which in many cases were developed specifically to be difficult to detoxify. What that results in is that we're building up molecules in our body that our liver, no matter how well our liver is working, has great difficulty getting rid of, and those molecules start binding to things like enzymes in our body and receptor sites in our body and such, and results in the metabolic activity not working as well as it should. 
So let's look at some examples. The one that I talk about in the beginning parts of my book, The Toxin Solution, is looking at diabetes. So I, when I graduated from Nature Medical, Medical School 33 years ago, I remember my first year in practice, I was so excited because in my first year, I finally saw my first diabetic patient. I was in practice for over nine months before I saw a diabetic patient because it was rare. Mm -hmm. Only about half of 1% of the population in the U.S. had diabetes. Wow. Now it's 20 times as common. What happened? So people say, well, obviously, people who are fat get way more diabetes. And it's true. People who are obese, particularly people who are morbidly obese, they have 20 times the risk of diabetes. So I say, aha, well, the reason we have all this diabetes is because people are being too fat. Now, it's true that people who are too fat have more diabetes. But if you look at people who are obese, but in the bottom 10%, of environmental toxin load, they have no increased risk for diabetes. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again, because that's surprises, surprising to people. Everybody knows if you're obese, you get diabetes. But if you're obese but don't have toxins, you don't get diabetes. So it's not the obesity that's the problem, it's what's in the fat cells that's the problem. So let's look at those fat cells, let's look at those chemicals in the fat cells. What we see is that <clears throat> those chemicals in the fat cells, a number of them, bind to the insulin receptor sites on the cells. So now you can't get sugar into the cells to produce energy. And, and if you can't do that, of course you die. So what happens is our pancreas has to overproduce insulin in order to get sugar into the cells. Now that's a great example of how incredibly adaptive our bodies are. So we have this problem of not being able to get sugar into the cells, produce more insulin, get the sugar into the cells. But we're now mistreating that organ of the body. And when you mistreat the pancreas for 20 or 30 years by making it overproduce insulin, now the pancreas burns out. And once it burns out, now you've got diabetes. So you may say, oh, diabetes is because of inaccurate pancreatic function. Diabetes is due to insulin resistance. That is all true. But why is that happening? And it's happening because we're blocking the insulin receptor sites. And in addition, if a person is being chronically exposed to arsenic, that arsenic poisons the pancreas as well. Now, why would a person be chronically exposed to arsenic? Few people are aware that 10% of the public water supplies in the United States, these supposedly water supplies controlled by the government, have arsenic levels known to induce diabetes in humans. Wow. So we're thinking, well, why? That, that doesn't make sense. Not only that, but if, our, if rice is grown in water that has arsenic in it, for some reason, rice is very good at absorbing arsenic, and arsenic gets into the body. In addition, up until just recently, the USDA allowed the use of arsenic compounds in chicken in order to kill the parasites in the chickens and also pump them up and make them you know, bigger so you can make more money. So it turns out that between rice, water, and chicken, 25% of adults in the United States, States have arsenic levels known to induce disease in humans. Wow. That's one toxin, just arsenic. Then we started looking at things like, well, I, I've been talking a lot. Maybe, maybe we should take a break. Oh, please, please continue. You've been talking a lot, but it's great stuff. I, okay. That's okay. The, so just one toxin, and in the context of looking at just sort of one disease, insulin resistance. I mean, yes. And I, I want people to understand the, the landscape of what you're talking about when it comes to toxins and disease. What yes. you just mentioned, which is that's just like one little sliver of, a, you know, maybe a fraction of 1% of this whole landscape. Exactly. So, and by, by the way, that's a good number. There are about 100 toxins now in our environment at high enough levels to induce disease in humans. Um, that's why I wrote that book, uh, The Toxin Solution. I just finished writing my newest textbook which called Clinical Environmental Medicine, where I teamed up with one of my graduates, uh, Dr. Walter Crinion, uh, to write this textbook for doctors. And we go through Toxin by toxin, we go through disease by disease, showing the diseases are now being due primarily to toxins. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that nutritional deficiencies are not a problem. They're a huge problem. I'm not saying lack of exercise is not a problem. It's a huge problem. I'm not saying stress is not a problem. It's a huge problem. What we've done is, to this base of inadequate nutrition, high stress, lack of exercise, we're now pouring all these toxins. So now you get all this disease. So, for example, people listening to this podcast or watching the video, how many of you put on uh, lotion this morning? How many of you put on perfume? How many of you took a shower uh, and had the hot water 
hit the shower curtain and you can smell the plastic. So what you're smelling and what you're exposing yourself to in these health and beauty aids are something called phthalates. And the phthalates, while we can detoxify them reasonably efficiently, they only take like a day or two to detoxify. The problem is we're exposed to them constantly and these things bind to the insulin receptor sites. And there's, I can tell from looking at just a lot of research, about one out of four cases of diabetes appears to be due to phthalates being exposed to all these plasticizers. Wow. Wow. Amazing. So I, I, there's like so many things that are so many nuances of this toxic sort of landscape that I want to talk about. Right. Um, you mentioned arsenic in the water supply and you've also mentioned uh, sort of vapors in the shower and one, one I, I think even just in that specific context, just one aspect of that is sort of the hot water hitting the plastic curtains and then now picking up toxins and now you're, you're inhaling vapors from that. Yes. But just even without the plastic curtains, just the vapors from tap water coming out, um, that tap water has, you know, chlorine and, and chlorine disinfection mm -hmm. byproducts and um, ammonia in many cases, chloramine and all kinds of other, other things in that water right. supply. Right. And my understanding is that the, the vapors, if you if you're inhaling the vapors from hot water, that's actually the, the the toxins become even more harmful from that inhalation route as compared to if you were to to drink tap water. Right, very very well said. So what's happening here is um, one of the most efficient ways to get a toxin into the body is to inhale it. So people look at um, they, 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 people know our water supplies can be contaminated because one of you use chlorine to kill organisms in the water supply, you leave behind what are called halogenated, halogenated organic, organic compounds. And these have some toxicity. When you're drinking the water, you don't absorb a lot of those toxins from the, from the water supply because we have no mechanism to break them down and try to keep it out of the body. But when you inhale it, you get a lot more. For example, cadmium. So we think about cadmium as being very, very toxic. If there's cadmium in the water supply, usually not much, but there's some, we only absorb like less than 10% of the cadmium in the water supply. Uh, you're more likely to get cadmium, unfortunately, in food. And we'll talk about that later on. But if you're smoking a cigarette that's been grown with tobacco, that's been grown with high phosphate fertilizers, there's a lot of cadmium in that. And your absorption rate of the cadmium goes up to about 90%. Wow. So what you inhale is way worse than what you drink and eat. I'm not saying you don't get from what you eat and drink, but inhaling is very effective. So when people get these little um, carbon block filters and put it on their, their faucet in the kitchen for drinking water, good idea, but you get much better benefit if you put it on your shower. Because what you're getting from your shower, you're inhaling much more, absorbed much more efficiently into your body than what you're drinking. Yeah, and I, I, I also, one of the things I teach is certainly that the little carbon block or the sort of Brita style pitcher filters with just a little, little sort of carbon filter um, are, are definitely not enough in terms yeah. of uh, filtering your drinking water. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the kind of filtration technologies that, that you recommend to people? Uh, yes. So first off, uh, even though these aren't great, they're still better than nothing. Okay. So don't get me wrong. Uh, so let me tell you what we've done in our home because we've, I've studied, we've studied this a lot. My wife, Laura, and I are really careful about that. So first off, we have a, a carbon block filter and metal precipitator on the main line coming into our house. That means all the water in our house has been made as clean as we can make it, with one exception, and that is uh, this technology, carbon block filter and the metal precipitator, will not get out arsenic or fluoride, but gets everything else, everything else out. So it's a very good step in that direction. So if your water supply does not have arsenic in it, you're okay. Fluoride, that's a more complicated situation, number one. Number two is, if you have horse air heating in your home, you want to put in a MERV 16 filter at least a MERV-8, but preferably a MERV-16. Because what the MERV-16 does is that it removes about 99% of the toxins in the air on every cycle through, through the MERV-16. And so we have our uh, forced air heating running all the time, so we're constantly cleaning up our air. And this is, this is significant, because when you start looking at um, what's in the air, particularly in people who are living in cities or within 100 yards of a highway, there's something called particulate matter in the air. It's called PM, and there's various sites of particulate matter, but the worst is what's called PM 2.5. The PM 2.5 means it's 2.5 micron diameter, 
which means that it bypasses most of the protective mechanisms in our respiratory tract and goes right into the body. So there's research that's been done on animals, for example, where they expose them to this particulate matter, and then they measure how long it takes the particulate matter, how much of it gets into the body, and within one hour, the particulate matter is found in the brains of these animals. So it not only does it bypass protective mechanism in the lungs, it also gets across the blood-brain barrier. So I look at, we clean up the water supply, clean up the air supply, all the health and beauty aids that we use are low, we have no phthalates in them, we only organically grown foods. Sorry, um, a oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've removed all the plastic containers in our home. All our uh, food storage is all in glass. So we just look at everything we can do to decrease toxic exposure because it, it is just huge. Yeah. So, so let, let, let's get into the, the air a little bit. Okay. So, so you mentioned, uh, what, what was the name of the particulate matter? Yeah, it's called part, particulate matter or PM 2.5 is the worst of them all. Okay. Um, so there's all kinds of things floating around in the air and, and it's particulate matter. And, and what, what exactly is that particulate matter actually composed of in terms of like what chemicals are? are, are great, great question. So the particulate matter is typically, they can be carbon, carbon uh, molecules. Okay. Uh, so they're, they're, um, they're just very, very small molecules. So it's not the molecule that's the problem. It's what's absorbed to the surface of the molecule that's the problem. And what's absorbed to them are called VLCs for volatile organic compounds. So those VLCs is what actually causes the damage. So our body is fairly good at protecting us from VLCs, but when they bind to the PM, PM 2.5s, it gets into our body much more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So for example, you look at a diesel truck going down the highway, and you see a kind of the blue-black uh, fumes coming out of the tailpipe. And you look at that, you think, boy, that can't be good for you. And the answer is, yeah, it's not good for you. So you look at research, for example, people living within 50 feet of a highway, you might say 50 feet of a highway, will drive down a major highway or freeway in any major town, and what do you see on the sides? All these high-rise apartments. Okay, within 50 feet, you get a 50% increased risk of a heart attack. If you're within 100 yards of a highway, you get a 15% increased risk of a heart attack just from the PM 2.5s. So these things, these things are really bad for us. Yeah. So we also have, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're giving the example of sort of outdoor air pollution of, of cars and exhaust fumes and that sort of thing. What about indoor environments with, with off-gassing from yes. carpets and furniture and things like that? Is that as big of a concern as in your opinion? It is. It's a big concern. <clears throat> so you, you, you have, um, the, as you said very well, the outgassing. So whenever you um, put a new carpet or uh, particularly if that carpet is glued down, you know, it's the worst thing you can do. Uh, you, paint, you paint your home, you put in um, a new furniture, spray that furniture with uh, stain resistant uh, compounds. Uh, these stain resistant car compounds are fluorinated hydrocarbons and these fluorinated hydrocarbons cause all kinds of things like, how about gout? You know, you have somebody out there who's listening to this who has gout. They say, well, it's because you have high uric acid levels. Well, if you're using uh, Teflon-coated pans, if you're using a lot of Gore-Tex clothing, if you're spraying your furniture with scotch guard, things like this, you're putting these fluorinated hydrocarbons into your body, and they do things like cause uric acid to increase, which gives you gout. <laughs> so I, I can go on example after example, but these chemicals, and, and something that's really important about, to realize about these chemicals, there's kind of two categories. There are, what are, there are what are called the persistent organic pollutants, and there are what are called the non-persistent organic pollutants. So non-persistent means that our bodies are pretty good to get rid of it. So a lot of these things that we're exposed to, they can get, our bike can get rid of them within hours to days. So as long as you're not exposed to them all the time, we're okay. The problem is we're exposed to these non-persistents all the time. Mm -hmm. I would say right now, look at the research on diabetes, for example, that over half of diabetes is due to the non-persistent compounds. So the best part about that is stop exposing yourself, your body get rid of them. Unless, of course, you have some genetics which make it more difficult, and then that can be an issue. But that's not as common a problem as just constant exposure. But the other side is what are called the persistent organic pollutants. These are typically what are called halogenated organic, organic compounds. They were designed to be difficult to break down by biological systems. To give you an example how bad that is, Everybody knows about PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. They were banned 40 years ago because they're so bad. Once again, your body, they're almost impossible to get rid of. 
the half-life of PCBs in the body is three to 25 years. You might say, okay, well, that's a long time. Is there a problem? Well, yes. How about women suffering rheumatoid arthritis? About 20% of rheumatoid arthritis, as near as I can tell, is from PCBs, because the PCBs are causing autoimmune reactions because they bind to the cartilage in the, in the tissues, and what, is, what was previously a normal tissue in the cartilage, when you bind a chemical to it, is now an abnormal tissue, and the body develops an, an, an uh, immune reaction to that. We call it autoimmune disease. <clears throat> I think autoimmune disease, why would our bodies become allergic to themselves? We don't become allergic to our normal tissues. We can't become allergic to our tissues that have been damaged by these chemicals and metals. So mm -hmm. PCBs, rheumatoid arthritis, very, very common. Another one, uh, DDT. Now we know we banned DDT 45 years ago, but DDT has a half-life in the body of two to 10 years. It's, it's worth mentioning, I think, maybe since it's, it's not totally clear maybe to, to some people listening, why were PCBs banned? Why was DDT banned? Right. <laughs> I want to mention that too. <laughs> but yeah, because of all the animal, animal research that was showing it's really bad, and the human research is showing it's really bad for us, we said, okay, fine, let's stop it. Just yes. like lead. Wow, lead was really bad. We finally stopped in, in the 1970s. So the half-life of lead in the body is, when it gets into your bones, it's between two and seven years. Remember, half-life is that time, amount of time it takes to get rid of half of it. Okay, So they hang around for a long time. So the good news is that a lot of these things were banned. The bad news is that they're in the environment because they're so difficult to break down. Even though the levels in the environment have gone down a little bit, the reality is that since they get into our bodies, they build up. So one of the reasons why so much disease starts at about the age of 50 is not because people are getting older. Well, they are getting older, of course. There's always going to be some problems with that. But what happens is they're accumulating all these toxins. So you look at somebody who's age 70 compared to somebody who's age 20. Somebody who's age 70 has five to 10 times the levels of these toxins in their bodies because you can't get rid of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just keep building up. So I, I would say to people, uh, hopefully people listen to this are relatively younger, you've got to stop the toxic exposure now because while you may not be noticing symptoms right now, they're built up in your body, the levels are getting higher, they're causing damage to, to the DNA, and once you around, hit around the age of 50, all hell breaks loose because all the damage has been accumulated. Yeah. So uh, I want to come back to something you, you went over a minute ago, which is autoimmune disease. Yes. Uh, you mentioned a room, the example of rheumatoid arthritis, right. but uh, autoimmune diseases more broadly are, are becoming an epidemic. Yes. Uh, and with Hashimoto's and Graves and yes. uh, Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis and, and lupus and a number of others. Um, within, so... It's interesting, within conventional medicine, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, but my, my perception is within conventional medicine, they generally look at these conditions as sort of, oh, the, the etiology is unknown. You know, sort of, we, we don't know what is causing these conditions, right. and, we don't, and they can't be cured. Um, within natural medicine, people are looking at uh, infections, people are looking at gut health problems, people are looking at toxins. People are looking at diet, stress, a number of other sort of layers of, of factors. Um, I think there's probably truth in all of those things to some extent, but I'm curious in your perception, what percentage of the autoimmune epidemic do you think is directly uh, attributable to uh, toxins? Yeah, good question. And, and also a great example of the kind of the medical approach versus the natural approach. <clears throat> so the medical approach is, well, the body makes mistakes and becomes uh, autoimmune to itself. Natural medicine says, why would our smart bodies become immune to themselves? And this is a new disease. Go back 100 years ago, these diseases didn't exist. What's changed? So uh, there's two people I recommend you interview if you can. Uh, Datis Karazian. Yeah, I uh, had him on. Oh, great. And Aristo Vajani. I haven't had him on. Okay, so they're the ones who have done a great work looking at how when these toxins bind to normal tissues, normal tissues now become abnormal and you get an autoimmune reaction. So what do the MDs do? Give you cortisone and all these anti-inflammatories to stop the immune reaction, autoimmune reaction. There's a place for that, but it doesn't deal with the cause. And if you don't deal with the cause, you become more and more dependent on the drugs. They have all their side effects and you get sicker and sicker. You go back and remove the cause, you don't need the drugs. Mm -hmm. okay. So what percent? <clears throat> Still working on that. 
So about three years ago, when I got a, a nice advance from my book, The Toxin Solution, I hired two very smart uh, graduates from Bastyr University to help me to actually look at that research, try to figure out for each chronic disease, how much of it is due to specific toxins. So we looked at disease after disease after disease. Uh, so we've, we've just started with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and that's where we found 20% of rheumatoid arthritis being due to PCBs. I would guess more of it's due to, due to other toxins as well. That's just as far as we've gotten the research. Mm -hmm. Asthma, another great example. You know, asthma is dramatically more common now than it used to be. Why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons. And when we talk about toxins, let's talk about things like mold. Most people aren't aware that as much as 50% of buildings in North America are water damaged. What that means is that there's been something wrong with either the building uh, or there's been spillage within the building, bathroom, things like this, where there's water has gotten into the building materials. We make building materials wet, mold grows on them, and mold releases all these chemicals. Interestingly, mold releases not only mycotoxins, which have specific toxicity, they also release the, what are called the volatile organic compounds. So when the mold is eating the building materials, it's releasing all these chemical gases. So you then start looking at asthma, and it turns out that in water damaged buildings, you have way more asthma than, you, than in water normal buildings. Uh, there's one study I've read, and I'll just state the study. I'm not sure if I believe it yet because the numbers are so profound. But this one study found that 71% of adults, of, of people with adult onset uh, asthma, in other words, didn't have asthma as children, as adults, they got asthma. 71% of the time is because of a water damaged building. And we take the people out of the water damaged building, their asthma goes away. I, 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 there, there are other diseases as well, but um, we're just we're early in the process to figure out what the what percent of that disease is due to uh, of autoimmune diseases is due to toxins. But yeah. it looks like I, I would bet it's at least half, if not more. Yeah, let's let's talk about some of the other diseases. Like I'm curious, uh, for example, on some of the other major killers, heart disease, cancer. Mm -hmm. Uh, what kinds of links have you found with toxins uh, in, in those? Okay, so let's look at let's look at uh, at uh, cancer. So there was a study done in Italy, and it was, I, I, mean, I love studies like this because it was a twenty year prospective study of twenty thousand people. And what that means is that they looked at twenty thousand people, then they followed for twenty years to see what happened. And what they looked at was in this particular province in Italy, uh, some of the wells had high levels of arsenic, some of the wells had no arsenic. So, so let's look at what happens to people when they live here for 20 years with arsenic in the water on one side and no arsenic in the others. And what they found, which was most dramatic, was in incredible increases in cancers. They saw lung cancer, prostate cancer, um, breast cancer, the uh, colon cancer. The cancers that actually kill people are dramatically increased when you're supposed to arsenic. Okay. You want to continue? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, if, you want me, if, you want be, if you want to be paranoid, spend the day talking with me <laughs> because yeah. as I looked at all this research, it's really bad. But the good news is that we, we can do something about it. We get the toxins out. Our, you know, I, obviously, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I, I really believe in the remarkable healing ability of the body. And what you find is that when you get the toxins out and get the nutrients in, the body has remarkable ability to heal. Now, we can't fix everything because sometimes disease progresses so far, there's just too much damage, but we can always improve people's health. Yeah. So I have so many case histories of patients with this, that, and the other chronic disease. I teach them how to live healthfully, have, have them eat real food with lots of nutrients in them, take the vitamins as they need, and then get the toxins out and the disease reverses. Yeah. And I, I want to get there. I want to get to some practical stuff. This this. <laughs> landscape of toxins and the link with diseases is so broad and it's definitely a struggle to pack a, even a quarter of, of your knowledge into the context of an hour-long interview but what what about heart disease and you know within that sort of you know in conventional medicine there's very much this narrative of you know it's it's caused by cholesterol and you know sort of we need statins what what's what's your take on the role of toxins in the context of atherosclerosis and, and coronary artery disease and that sort of it, well, it's huge. So, so everybody knows that people with high cholesterol levels have more heart disease. But think about this for a second. About half the cholesterol in our body is made by the body and half comes from our food. Now, if cholesterol was so bad for us, why does our body make cholesterol? 
So I want to be very clear. It's not the cholesterol that's the problem. It's the oxidized cholesterol that's the problem. So what's that, what's that mean? So we have, we have cholesterol, normal, a normal molecule. As a matter of fact, you look at people who are older people, old people with the highest levels of cholesterol have the least Alzheimer's disease, okay? Because cholesterol is a normal, important molecule. But when you damage it, when you oxidize it, now it becomes very damaging. So the oxidized cholesterol results in increasing levels of homocysteine, and it particularly damages the arteries. So why does cholesterol become oxidized? Well, it becomes oxidized because of things like, well, if you're eating scrambled eggs and cooking eggs at high temperatures, eggs have a lot of cholesterol in them, high temperatures in the presence of oxygen, you're gonna oxidize the cholesterol, now it becomes damaging. Uh, how about if you have a diet low in antioxidants? So cholesterol can be oxidized fairly easily. If you have diet low in antioxidants, you can't protect the cholesterol from oxidation. That's why people with high levels of HDL cholesterol compared to LDL cholesterol have less damage to the body because HDL cholesterol is more resistant to oxidation than is LDL cholesterol. But it goes further, and that is, <clears throat> what if you're being exposed to environmental toxins? And many of those environmental toxins oxidize the cholesterol, and that is how you start getting all this damage. Mm. So when you start looking at which toxins are causing the most damage to the heart, well, particulate matter is really problematic because it's causing oxidation to the cholesterol. I uh, look at lead. Lead causes a lot of heart disease because it's causing oxidative, oxidative damage in the body. Look at the PCBs and you look at just some of these chemicals and metals. They, damage, they just damage cholesterol and damage the body. They also directly damage the, uh, the, um, the arteries. And they also do something which is very significant, and that is they damage the mitochondria so mitochondria can't produce enough energy. And all of the detox enzymes are dependent upon the availability of ATP from the mitochondria. So I, 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 I thought we were going to go off in a little different direction in this conversation about energy. So you in know, your I'm, look... I'm remembering, um, I think it was an interview with you or maybe in your book. Do, do you play pickup basketball at your local gym? And yes. you, you were talking about ibuprofen, I think, in yes. one interview. Can you, can you chat a bit about that and the role of how that affects mitochondrial function? Yes. So I'm an avid basketball player, and I noticed that about, at about age 50, all my friends disappear because their bodies are broken down by that point. And why are their bodies broken down? Well, one, because their nutrition, nutrition is not very good. But I don't know. Do you play basketball? I played growing up. I played soccer and martial arts, and now I surf and I rock climb. And so I'm okay, great. You're very active. So, you know, so when you're on the court playing basketball, running up and down the full court, at the end, at the end of a couple of hours, you're, you're tired and you're really sore. So what do my friends do? They're popping ibuprofen and aspirin and Advil, all these anti-inflammatory chemicals. And while they shorten the duration of the inflammatory process, they do things like poison the mitochondria and they block the repair mechanisms. So what's happening to them is that they get the short-term relief, but they're making the body break down more quickly. One of the questions I like asking in my lectures, and although I don't know if it will have the shock value anymore because I've been talking about it for too long, when I talk about uh, mitochondrial health, I look at my audience, and I talk mainly to healthcare professionals these days, and ask people to guess how much ATP, that's the energy coin, uh, the mitochondria produce every day. I ask people to make guesses. Then people guess like milligrams to grams and such. And I look at people and say, at rest, the mitochondria produce our body weight in ATP every day. So you weigh, if you weigh 150 pounds, you're producing 150 pounds of ATP every day if you just sit down. Now, if you go play basketball like I do, you produce way more. So these mitochondria are incredibly metabolically active, which means the nutrients they need are not there, or if they're being exposed to environmental toxins that are poisoning them, uh, the, what are called the complexes in the mitochondria, you're gonna have not only decreased energy production, but you're also gonna have more leakage of high energy electrons in the mitochondria, and you're gonna burn your mitochondria out. That's one reason why most athletes don't last beyond about age 35, because they pretty much have damaged the mitochondria so much that they, they, can't, they don't have the energy levels anymore. Yeah. So we then look at drugs like, um, um, like the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but also how about things like statin drugs? So statin drugs, they're prescribed to people to lower the cholesterol levels, and statin drugs do lower cholesterol levels. But statin drugs also decrease the production of a molecule in the body called coenzyme, coen, um, called a coenzyme QA. 
and CoQ A is absolutely critical for transporting high energy electrons in the body. So we decrease the production of this critical molecule by stand drugs, you leak more high energy electrons. So that's why people who are the, um, uh, when one of the main side effects of uh, stand drugs is this muscle pain that people get. And that muscle pain is because of the mitochondrial damage. Yeah, interesting. So, you know, the, I, I should also mention there's, you know, mitochondria is a, a big thing that I talk about and, and teach about in, in my energy blueprint work. And, uh, you know, there's oftentimes in biology courses in high school and college, people are sort of just taught that mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They produce energy. But we, we know now there's a lot of research that's come out in the last five, 10 years showing that they're, they're much more than that. They're sort of environmental sensors that are controlling whether the cell is sort of going more into energy mode or defense mode. There's research linking mitochondrial dysfunction uh, and, and DNA damage to aging itself to a variety of different chronic diseases to chronic fatigue syndrome to neurological diseases like alzheimer's and parkinson's uh to to all sorts of things so mitochondria are are really damn important um with with that in mind you mentioned a couple things that can damage them mm -hmm. what are some of the other toxins that that you found are the most problematic when it comes to mitochondrial health so um another good question Let's see, what do I think are the worst? Uh, by the way, I say Coke, I, I, I'm being distracted because I said Coke, uh, Coke I meant Coke 10 okay? Yeah. I said, 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 that, said that wrong. So when look at the mitochondria, uh, let's see. So statins, the uh, nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are particularly problematic. Um, Have you seen research around like, for example, the, some of the heavy metals or BPA or phthalates or? Right, right. Just trying to think of what are the worst because I've been so focused on stand. Oh, here's one that people won't, mostly don't think about. How about antibiotics? Mm. Okay. So research has been done. We look at, we give people antibiotics, you know, tetracycline, for example, penicillin. Um, oh, some of the uh, more recent drugs. When you give these drugs, and these are done in animal studies, you give drugs to, these, to the animals, you see not a decreased production of ATP, you see increased leakage of high-energy electrons, you see increased damage to the mitochondrial uh, DNA. Mm -hmm. So we, get, we have a massive infection, you go to your doctor and the doctor gives you antibiotics, which by the way, if you got a massive infection, antibiotics are a good idea. You feel really tired afterwards, you might say, well, it's just your body recovering from the infection. That's true, but it's also your mitochondria recovering from the anti antibiotic uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. okay. Excellent. So I, I'm sure that we could go all day with um, you know, lots of, of details and nuances of the discussion of various toxins and their link with various diseases. I'm, I'm curious if I can ask this from you um, because I know that there's so many things that we haven't delved into, like for example, fluoride or BPA or, or you know, a number of mercury, a number of other specific things. Um, can you give sort of a very quick, almost like a list, like a bullet point list of some of the most significant toxins that we're being exposed to? Yes. Yes. And that, that's a, a key question because uh, when I, in my lectures, when I say to people, now, how do, you, how do you get rid of the toxins? The first three interventions are avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. Mm. Okay? Because some of these things, when they get in your body, they're so hard to get rid of. And the number one worst source of toxins is, in my opinion, farmed fish. Mm. It turns out, Farm fish are very high in these uh, persistent organic pollutants like PCBs and things like this. You might say, well, why is farm fish so high? Because the food they're feeding them is contaminated. Mm -hmm. So farm fish reflect what they're being, being fed. So one reason why I think that the uh, persistent organic pollutants are so bad, like the PCBs, the DDT, uh, and many of the, uh, the, uh, fertilizer, the, um, the pesticides used in our, in our food supply is because they're so hard to get rid of. Another one of the really bad toxins turns out to be cadmium. Uh, unfortunately, when soybeans are grown with high phosphate fertilizers, many of those high phosphate fertilizers are contaminated with cadmium. There's a study that was done here in Seattle by the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center where they're looking at osteoporosis in older women. And they're finding that there was um, a very strong correlation between cadmium levels in these women and osteoporosis because it turns out cadmium directly poisons 
what are called the osteoblasts that produce, um, that, that make our bones. You know, bones constantly recycle. You got the osteoclasts that break down the bones, you got osteoblasts that build up the bones, and so our bones are constantly recycling as part of the way of removing damaged bone and putting back in the uh, good healthy bone. So it turns out cadmium is a significant uh, toxin. Then they started looking at, well, where is the cadmium coming from? And they found it's coming from the uh, soybeans that are grown with high phosphate fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And they determined that 20% of osteoporosis is due to cadmium. So wow. another example of a bad toxin. Uh, uh, I mentioned before arsenic, arsenic because 25% of people have arsenic levels high enough to cause disease in them. That's another bad one as well. Phthalates um, and bisphenol A in terms of everyday exposure. So even though we're pretty good to get rid of them, we're constantly being exposed to them and they cause a lot of disease as well. Mm -hmm. What about uh, glyphosate? What's, what's your take on that? And that's, that's still, I think, a relatively controversial one. There's still you know, a lot of sort of people saying in the, in the skeptic community saying that, oh, it's all hype and none of this is proven. What, what's, what's your take on the link between glyphosate and, and damage to our bodies? So the glyphosate is a really challenging one, uh, mainly because the research has been, um, I'll be gentle about it, and I'll say it's been obfuscated. <laughs> okay, mm. so when you look at glyphosate as a pure compound, it's modestly toxic. So no question, it's modestly toxic. But it's not terrible, but it's modestly toxic. The problem is that's not what we're, what we're being exposed to. What we're being exposed to is Roundup. Roundup is 50% glyphosate and 50% what are called inert ingredients, um, <laughs> which, are these, which are basically petroleum distillates. And it turns out if you look at petroleum distillates independently, they're about a thousand times more toxic than glyphosate. Mm -hmm. So most of the research that's being used to say glyphosate is safe uses pure glyphosate. But what we'll be exposed to is actually Roundup. Mm -hmm. so we need more research to say, okay, now Roundup is the actual form being used. How toxic is that? Now, I think it's probably pretty toxic, but the research is so dirty, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't be clear about it. So I think it's a problem. And, and just for people unclear about what that means, when you say the research is dirty, what are you referring to? We're not looking at Roundup research. We're looking at glyphosate research. Okay. So we're saying Roundup safe because of glyphosate, but it looks like glyphosate is not the most toxic part of Roundup. And are, are, I think you're also implying that the research has, has sort of intentionally been obfuscated by sort of the, the corporations that stand to lose a lot if, if um, research comes out that makes their compounds not look so good. Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to hesitate to um, ascribe uh, <laughs> motives, motives to people. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Sure. Right. And I'll just say to people, folks, eat organically grown food. I know it's more expensive, but we'd rather spend the money on doctors and be sick and die early. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, one other thing I want to talk about before we get into practical stuff, which is you, you mentioned this very briefly in passing, which is like skincare stuff and cosmetics. Right. Um, what are some of the, the concerns there with some of the moisturizers and shampoo, conditioner, mm -hmm. soaps, toothpaste, th those kinds of things? Right. So, you know, Obviously, as human beings, we want to look nice, smell nice, and you know, be pretty, okay? And these health and beauty days are very helpful for doing that. The question then is, though, what are we putting in these health and beauty aids? So, for example, in the past, women would use uh, leaded compounds and arsenic compounds so they could have redder lips and whiter skin, okay? Well, that was bad for them, bad for anybody who puts lead in their body or puts arsenic in their body. But we now we want to make these health and beauty aids smell nice. So to make them smell nice, we'll put fragrances, fragrances in them. And the fragrances typically are then have to have phthalates with them because these phthalates solubilize and stabilize the fragrances. So pretty much any time you use a health and beauty aid that has a fragrance in it, most likely has phthalates as well. And these phthalates are, are metabolic disruptors and they also bind to some receptor sites and increase the risk of diabetes. So you can get these health and beauty aids that don't have these chemicals or metals in them, and that's strongly recommended. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So you mentioned before, avoid, avoid, avoid. The, mm -hmm. those, those are the first three steps of, right. of how we deal with this situation. Um, I, I guess you could maybe talk a bit about some of the strategies for avoidance, and then what do you do beyond avoidance to actively sort of detoxify some of these compounds and, and get them out of your body? Yeah, so avoidance is critical. <clears throat> so as I said before, you know, all the water coming to your house, all the air, 
uh, the health and beauty aids, your cooking utensils, your storage utensils. Uh, when people come into your house, have them take their shoes off. Use all these ways to avoid exposure. Eat organically grown foods. Uh, there was a study done here in Seattle where they looked at children who ate organically grown foods compared to children who ate conventionally grown foods. Children eating conventionally grown foods had 10 times the levels of organophosphates in their bodies. Why is that a problem? Organophosphates are neurological poisons. If you look at uh, children born to women, in the top 10% of organophosphate pesticide levels compared to children born to women with the bottom 10%, those children have a seven point drop in IQ. Three studies have stu checked these children. You have organophosphates in the pregnant mothers, their children are dumber. Now they're dumber, they also have increased risk of uh, ADHD and things of this nature and more disease. So it's bad for them. So avoid, 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 not just for yourself, but for your children and your grandchildren, because now the research is showing transgenerational effects. If you take a pregnant mouse, give her a toxic uh, a diabetes inducing toxins, her children will get diabetes, even though her children aren't being exposed to the toxins. But her grandchildren get the diabetes as well due to what are called epigenetic changes in how their genetics are manifest. Big, big problem. So avoid, avoid exposure. The next part is how do you get them out of the body more quickly? Well, actually, there's an intermediate step. Not you have to get them out of the body, but you also want to protect the body from the toxins. So, for example, most of these metal toxins like arsenic and lead and cadmium and, and mercury, and et cetera, one of the key ways in which they cause damage is by competing with trace minerals for enzyme systems. So an enzyme is a protein, but the protein is just a protein until you put a little cofactor on it. The cofactor is typical of vitamin or mineral. If your diet is deficient in vitamins and minerals, you're more susceptible to the environmental toxins. If you look at the trace mineral content of conventional grown food now, compared to 50 years ago, that we, we only have good data for about the last 50 years. That's more like 70 years now. Anyway, the trace mineral content has decreased 50 to 85%. So even if you're trying to eat you know, healthy food, if it's conventionally grown, it doesn't have trace minerals anymore, and it's probably contaminated, which means you actually don't have the trace minerals to protect yourself from these toxins. So that's one reason why vitamins are a good idea, because they protect you from these toxins. But then you want to get them out of the body. It turns out the way you get them out of the body, it depends upon the kind of toxin you're being exposed to. So for example, if you're exposed to arsenic, all you gotta do is avoid it. If you're exposed to mercury, that's actually pretty tough. So to get mercury out of the body, I recommend people use something called N-acetylcysteine, or NAC for short. And what NAC does is it increases the production of glutathione in the body, and that glutathione help, helps get the mercury out of the body more effectively. Now, if you have high levels, you can also get a drug. Uh, it's a fairly non-toxic drug called DMSA. And I actually prescribe that to my patients with high levels of mercury or lead. I can give you a couple of really interesting case histories. So you, that's a way to use kind of the drug to get out of the body. PCBs, these uh, persistent organic pollutants, are hard to get out. And it turns out that fiber is very good for getting these things out of the body. And matter of fact, one of the reasons we have so much trouble now getting rid of the toxins is that as our detox systems evolved as a species, we're consuming 100, 150 grams of fiber a day in our diet. And that fiber in the gut binds to these toxins when the liver dumps them out, get them out of the body. Well, we now have 15 to 20 grams of fiber a day in our diet, which means there's not enough fiber there to absorb the toxins our liver's working so hard to get rid of. So we then reabsorb them through something called interhepatic recirculation. Mm -hmm. So fiber is a really good, gentle, long-term way to get toxins out of the body. Now, if you have a lot of things like PCBs, I hate to say this, but drugs in the category of what are called uh, biosequestrants, like cholestamide, cholestyramine and such, they actually will increase the rate at which we get them out of the body. And if you can get some of the old time Pringles made with Olestra, <laughs> I'm, I'm not rec going to recommend processed foods very often, but we look at Olestra with uh, Olestra in the Pringles, it actually pulls toxins out of the body. One of the most effective ways I found so far to get toxins out of the body. The, I remember one of the classic side effects though was anal leakage. Yes, that anal leakage. Which is a side effect I, I generally like to avoid. Yes, right. So it's smelly anal leakage, okay? <laughs> and so what's happening there is that it's absorbing so much of the fats and such uh, that it's, it, it um, gets kind of fluid and gets it out of the body. With that absorption of the fats, it's also absorbing the toxins at the same time. Right. Uh, another thing that's really useful is sweating. So if you, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Stephen Genuis, uh, an MD in Edmonton, Alberta, 
uh, did a really cool study. He took 10 normal people, he put them in a sauna, and sweat uh, uh, freely. He then collected the sweat to see what was in it, and it was full of toxins. Everybody kind of knows, it seems like when you're sweating, and you're in a sauna, it feels like it's detoxifying. It is detoxifying. It's mm -hmm. very good. It gets rid of mercury, it gets rid of lead, it gets rid of PCBs, it gets rid of all these chemicals. It's very, very effective. So sweating works very well. And it turns out it doesn't matter how you sweat. You can sweat like I do when I'm running playing basketball. You can do it in a sauna. Uh, I don't recommend steam baths because I'm concerned about recirculating the toxins. Yeah. But anyway, sweating is a great way of getting toxins out of the body. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of saunas. Are there, are there any other notable strategies here uh, as far as getting rid of, of toxins or that pretty, I mean, that, I know that covers most, most of the. Yeah, those, those, those are, my, those are my, my, my preferred ones. There are more things you can do. Like if you like, if you like herbal medicines, uh, milk thistle, Silvium marianum, milk thistle helps the liver get rid of toxins more effectively. Uh, another good one is um, curcumin. Curcumin is quite good at not helping get rid of toxins, but also protecting our body from the toxins. Yeah. So there, other things you can do. But the, 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 the best ones, as far as I'm concerned, fiber, NAC, sweating, those, those are really, really effective strategies. Excellent. I, I have like one or two more questions on okay. this. Um, are you, how, much, how much have you looked into the NRF2 pathway and, and kind of like hormetic stressors and how they affect uh, the internal cellular antioxidant and detoxification systems. And how important do you feel that is in, in this context? Because it's something that I, I almost never see anyone talk about, but I personally think is a very important piece of this puzzle. Um, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I haven't delved into that as deeply um, for this purpose because I just haven't got to it, <laughs> to be honest with you. But yeah. it turns out that if you look at the things that tend to uh, activate the the, the, the nerf genomics. Um, they also turn out to increase the number of the detox systems as well. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a reason why people who drink red wine uh, tend to live longer, okay? Because that resveratrol does a lot of good things. And one of the things it does is it increases these nerf acti activations. It increases mitochondrial ATP production. There, there's a lot, of, a lot of benefit you see there. So I think there's a lot there. I haven't delved into it deeply enough yet to say more than that. Okay. I, so one of the, the ideas that I'm really um, interested in is the, the concept of toxin resistance mm -hmm. and, and sort of like, I, I'm definitely 100% on board with the idea that we should be avoiding and trying to eliminate these things as much as possible. Right. But I'm, I'm also kind of under the, the, the opinion that um, these things are so ubiquitous and so you know, essentially impossible to avoid completely that I, I think that we also need to build up our resilience at the cellular level and our, our, our cellular ability to detoxify these compounds efficiently and effectively. Full agreement. That, that's why, um, going back to my comment earlier, why a organically, an organically grown food diet rich in nutrients is so important mm -hmm. because one of the best ways to keep these things from binding to your, to your enzymes make sure those enzymes are already saturated with the vitamins and minerals that they need yeah. and make you more resistant. And, and, and also there's a, a challenging part of this as well. So, you know, but in the liver, we have these phase one and phase two enzymes that break down the toxins. Well, it turns out the phase one enzymes are highly energy dependent, which means that the body only produces them when it's needed. So it's what they're called, what are called inducible enzymes. So if you're a person like me, living in a relatively low toxic environment, I produce less of these enzymes, which means I'm now more susceptible to the initial exposure to the toxins because it takes a while, typically a couple of days, to rev up these enzymes. Mm -hmm. So um, the resilience, if you want to be resilient, you might say, well, I should always expose myself to some level of toxins. You, you could say it might be a good strategy, but do you really want to waste all your metabolic energy and, and expose yourself to those things? And I don't think it's such a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, one of the, the cool thing I've explored the, the research around hormetic stress very deeply. And one of the, the interesting things is that you, you get a, a, a broad resistance effects from ex specific stressors. So for example, ec exercise as a stressor um, is not, you know, necessarily, it's not the same as a mercury stressor, a mercury exposure or PCB, but you're, you're getting a, a broad resistance effect at the cellular level of yeah. your cells are actually become more resistant and resilient yeah. in the face of a broad range of 
not only, not just exercise, but also chemical yeah. exposures yeah. as well. Yes, that, that, that's one of the um, uh, theories about why exercise is so protective because exercise is an oxidative event. Mm -hmm. And because it's an oxidative event, your body produces the antioxidants to protect, your, protect us from it. Yeah. So there are a number of examples. So cabbage, for example. Why do women who consume cabbage have less breast cancer? Well, because cabbage actually has some toxic chemicals in it. Those toxic chemicals induce a bunch of enzymes in our liver to protect us from the cabbage. And at the same time, protects us from a bunch of the chemicals that induce a, a, a breast cancer in, in people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I mean, think about why, why, why did we develop all these interesting enzymes in our liver? Got all these p 450s you got all these phase two conjugation enzymes and such. Well, it was, to, it was to protect us from the molecules in the foods that we were eating. Specifically, toxic phytochemicals in particular. Yes. A, a lot of the things that are mistakenly referred to as antioxidants um, are, are actually indirect antioxidants. They're actually function as pro-oxidants when they hit our bodies and then, and then build up this internal antioxidant defense system and sort of ramp up our body's production of these antioxidant compounds. So I'm what, so, yeah. glad you brought that up. Yeah, so why, why do the cabbage family produce all these chemicals? They don't need them for metabolism. They need them to protect themselves from the insects and the fungus and such that's trying to eat them, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're poisonous chemicals. Yeah. So we were fortunate, to, well, not fortunate, those of us who evolved to become our current human beings <laughs> are the ones who got the enzymes to break those things down so we, we could eat those foods. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious, have you looked into broccoli sprouts at all? There's a lot of uh, emerging research. Very, very strong. Yes. Yeah, not only that, but the, uh, another interesting thing about the broccoli sprouts is they um, are very effective against H. pylori in the stomach. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows about H. pylori being the, quote, the cause of stomach ulcers. That's not the cause of stomach ulcers. The cause of stomach ulcers is we've lost our ability to keep it under control. And it turns out broccoli sprouts are really effective at killing off the H. pylori. Mm -hmm. So my final question to you, uh, you mentioned briefly in passing the importance of fiber and sort of the gut root of, of detoxification, how we eliminate toxins through that pathway and, and the sort of backflow if we don't have uh, enough uh, fiber in the diet. But there's, I think, one more layer to that story of the gut, which you talk about in the toxin solution, uh, which is sort of gut problems, microbiome problems, dysbiosis, gut permeability. Can you, just this, this is my final question to you, I know I've kept you a little over time, but can you talk a bit about sort of the role of, of keeping the gut healthy in, in this picture of, of eliminating the body of toxins? I, I want to step back a little bit and give you a bigger answer to your question. <clears throat> you know, the idea of um, going on detox right now is such a popular idea. I want to say, say to people, don't go on a detox program until your body's ready. Hmm. You have to make sure that your organs of elimination are functioning properly. One of the biggest loads on the liver is a toxic gut. Mm -hmm. So as in my book, I go through a pro program where I say to people, okay, now let's spend two weeks cleaning up your gut. What I mean by that is, you want to get rid of bad bacteria in your gut, put good bacteria in your gut, back into your gut, and heal the gut membrane so you stop overloading the liver with toxins from the gut. Then you've got to go through and get the liver cleaned up. And so I put a two-week program with how to get the liver functioning properly. And then, this is brand new, I didn't have to do this 30 years ago, I tell people now how to get your kidneys working better as well, because all this chemical exposure we're getting, including all these drugs, we're now getting, we now have an epidemic of kidney failure, once again, a relatively new disease for people. So you gotta clean it all up. So when we look at the gut, start with the gut, because if you can decrease the toxic load from the gut, you now freed up the liver to, get, to be able to deal with all those other toxins coming from the environment. How do you clip a toxic gut? You first off kill off the bad bacteria, and I use an herb called golden seal. And I've used this on so many patients. And what's nice about gold seal is that it kills off the toxic bacteria, and it leaves the good bacteria alone. Then we want to give the person something to bind to the toxins that are being released as the bad bacteria are being killed. They, um, I, I, you may recall from my book, I actually apologize to my early patients. They call it a practice of medicine for good reason, because you have to practice for a while to figure out what you're doing. <laughs> so in the early days, when I saw people with toxic guts, I give them golden seal, they come back and say, oh God, I felt so sick after the golden seal. And so why would they get sick from golden seal? Then, oh, aha, we kill off all the bad bacteria. When they die, they release all the chemicals. So of course you have a toxic reaction. So you want to bind to the toxins as they're being released. So I use things like 
uh, fiber. I use something called PGX, uh, the, kind of these fibers to bind to the toxins. Then you want to reseed with good healthy bacteria, like multi-strain bacteria, you know, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, all those good ba healthy bacteria. And then finally, you want to use what are called prebiotics. Uh, they help promote the growth of the bacteria. I said, my second final is you also they want to give people nutrients to stimulate regeneration of the gut mucosa. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and it turns out things like omega-3 fatty acids, kiwi fruit, <laughs> it's kind of a strange one, um, uh, glutamine, all these nutrients are really good at promoting the healing of the gut mucosa so you get a permeability control back on working properly again. Yeah, and that just to, to tie things up neatly, connected back to toxins, we're, we're creating that sort of proper gut lining health and, and c proper gut microbiome health and, and correcting the dysbiosis in a way that leads to more effective elimination of the toxins through that gut elimination pathway. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yes. So it's not only the gut elimination pathway, but it's also, I want to stress this as much as I can, it's decreasing the load on the liver. Mm -hmm. and, and all time, so two all time naturopathic adages, I think you appreciate this. One of them is disease begins in the gut. A hundred years ago, naturopaths were saying disease begins in the gut. And everybody was saying, well, that's weird. It doesn't make any sense. We now know they were right. The second uh, naturopathic adage is when in doubt, detoxify the liver, okay? Mm -hmm. This whole idea is you got to decrease the toxic load on the body because what are toxins? They are metabolic poisons that disrupt our proper function of the body. Mm -hmm. Our bodies have remarkable ability to heal and to function properly as long as you get the nutrients in and you get the toxins out. Because without the nutrients and without with toxic overload, your, your body's not gonna work very well, which means you're gonna get more disease. Yeah. Absolutely. Last thing, what are your top three pieces of advice? And you can, can I quickly mention anything that you've mentioned thus far in this interview, top three things that you want to leave people with. Marry a, a, a spouse who loves to cook organically grown whole foods and make them tasty. <laughs> I, I'm so blessed. That's number one. Okay. Now with a number one means eat organically grown foods. Okay. Um, you know, get your own foods, get enough sleep, exercise, have lovely relationships. That does it. And detox. Well, if you did those things, you don't have to detox as much. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 exercise. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you covered it. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pizzorno. I've really, really enjoyed this, and uh, it was a pleasure connecting with you. I've, I've, like I said, admir admired your work for a very long time, and. Uh, it's uh, really an honor to have you on. And um, where can people find out more about your work? Your, your work? Obviously, they can get your book on uh, The Toxin Solution and your other books on Amazon. Sure. But where do you want to direct uh, listeners to, to learn more from you? Well, they can go to my website, uh, www.drpizzorno.com. That's D-R-P-I-Z-Z-O-R-N-O.com. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dr. Pizzorno, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks for your great work as well. Thanks. Bye. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.